This is an MJA Inc. Investigations Warning. This MJA podcast is rated E for explicit. Some details of a case and language used on this podcast might be upsetting to some of our listeners. Listeners' discretion is advised. And for those who are still with us, kick back and enjoy the show. No greater honor will ever be bestowed upon an investigator than when they are entrusted with an investigation into the death of a human being. MJA Inc. Investigations believes in these words. You can read past public publications that MJA considers it an honor for us to work on the cases that we do. Welcome to our MJ podcast, Deep Into the Woods, the series, Welcome to Serial Killer Avenue. This is Episode 3, Part 4, The New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. We are coming to you from our office in Plattsburgh, New York located in the Adirondack Mountains. My name is Mark, and I will be your host for tonight's show. Joining me later will be our co-host, Olivia. Also joining us will be our special guest and special investigator, Wayne Perry, one of the leading experts concerning this serial killer. Welcome to New Bedford, Massachusetts. The New Bedford Highway Killer is an unidentified serial killer who murdered at least nine women. 
The same killer is involved with the disappearance of two other women in New Bedford, Massachusetts. These crimes started in March of 88 and ended in April of 1989. The killer is also suspected to have assaulted several other women. Even though the female victims were taken from New Bedford, Massachusetts, they were all found in different surrounding towns, including Darsmith, Freetown, and Westport, Massachusetts, along Route 140. The female victims had similar backgrounds. The women were usually involved in drug addiction and prostitution. The women began disappearing around New Bedford, Massachusetts in 1988. Nine bodies were discovered strangled and dumped near area highways. There are two women who remain missing to this day. A local lawyer and former drug addict had things happen beyond his control and he became a suspect in the investigation. It's public record that the lawyer had known or worked for several of the female victims. The lawyer had relocated to Florida but had to return to Massachusetts to face a murder charge on one of the deaths. The murder charge was eventually dropped. The lawyer blamed authorities for ruining his career and his life. The former lawyer died in 2010. There was another man, Tony DeGarza, who was charged separately with raping six prostitutes and he was considered another suspect in the New Bedford Highway killings. But the so-called suspect denied killing any women and took his own life in 1990. The Victims Victim 1 Robin Rhodes, a white female who was 28 years old, was last seen in New Bedford, Massachusetts around March or April of 1988. The victim's body was found on March 28, 1989 along Route 140 southbound in Freetown, Massachusetts by a search dog. Victim 2 Rochelle Clifford Doparella a white female who was 28 years old when she was last seen in New Bedford in late of April 1988. The victim's body was found on December 10, 1988 along Reed Road, two miles from Interstate 195. Victim 3 Deborah Lynn McConnell, a white female, 25 years old, was last seen in New Bedford sometime in May of 1988. The victim's body was found on December 1, 1988, off of Route 140 northbound in Freetown, Massachusetts, by a search dog. Victim 4 Deborah Maderos, a white female, 30 years old, was last seen on May 27, 1988, in New Bedford. The victim's body was found on July 3, 1988, almost 30 feet from the road on the northbound Route 140 in Freetown, Massachusetts, just over the Lakeville town line. A motorist who had stopped for a break on the Sunday of July 4th weekend came upon the partially clothed, unrecognizable corpse who had a brawl around her neck. Victim 5 
This female is missing. Christine Montero, a black female, 19 years old, was last seen in New Bedford in late May of 1988. The victim's family last heard from her in May of 1988. The 19-year-old black female has never been heard from again. The 19-year-old black female fits a profile and is believed to have been another victim of the New Bedford Highway killer. Her disappearance remains unsolved. Let's take a pause for the cause, and when we return, we will profile six more cases of the New Bedford Highway serial killer. Be back in a moment. Welcome back to our MJ Podcast. This series, Welcome to Serial Killer Avenue. This is Episode 3, Part 4, The New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. Victim 6 This female is missing. Marilyn Roberts, a white female, 34 years old, was reported missing on April 1, 1988 and was last seen in New Bedford in June of 1988, so her family thought she was okay. After not hearing from their daughter, the family reported her missing a second time in December of 1988 they haven't heard about they had heard about a possible serial murder in the area the 34 year old white female fits this profile and is believed to have been another victim of the New Bedford highway killer her disappearance remains unsolved case 7 Nancy Pava, a white female, 36 years old, was last seen on July 7, 1988, in New Bedford. The victim's body was found on July 30, 1988, by two men on motorcycles on the west side of Interstate 95 in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. The murder victim was identified in December of 1988. Victim 8 Deborah DeMello, a white female, 35 years old, was last seen on July 7th, July 11th, 1988, in New Bedford, Massachusetts. The victim's body was found on November 8, 1988 off the eastbound Reed Road ramp on Interstate 195 by a state, state highway crew. The 35-year-old victim had walked away from a prison work release program in Rhode Island on June 18, 1988. Victim 9 Mary Rose Santos, a white female, 26 years old, was last seen on July 16, 1988 in New Bedford, Massachusetts. The victim was dropped off in the downtown area and was last seen dancing in a bar five hours later. The victim's body was found on March 31, 1989 on a road heading 
to Horseneck Beach in Westport, Massachusetts, along Route One, uh, uh, Route 88. Victim 10. Sandra Botello, a white female, 24 years old, was last seen on August 11, 1988, in New Bedford. The victim's body was found on April 24, 1989, along Interstate 195 in Marion, Massachusetts, by a state highway crew. The 24-year-old was the last woman found in the New Bedford Highway serial killer case. Victim 11 Don Mendez, a black female 20 who is 25 years old, was last seen on September 4th, 1988 in New Bedford, Massachusetts. The victim's body was found on November 29th, 1988 on the westbound Reed Road ramp off of Interstate 195 by a search dog. These women were victims of the serial killer, but they were also victims of law enforcement and the media. The lead stories were about victim blaming when the fact the lead story should have been about the serial killer and catching them. In our MJ case files, we have three cases where the victims were dancers in gentlemen clubs and such. Everyone has a right to live, no matter who you are and no matter what race you are. Let's take a short pause for the cause, and when we return, our co-host Olivia will be on the line. Also joining us will be our special guest, Wayne Perry, one of the leading experts concerning this serial killer. We will be back in a moment. Welcome back to our MJ podcast, this series, Welcome to Serial Killer Avenue. This is episode three, part four, the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. We have our co-host, Olivia, on the line. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, thanks. Also joining us is Wayne Perry, one of the leading experts on this case. How are you tonight, Mr. Perry? I'm doing fine also. And could you please tell our viewers and listeners how long you have been working on this case? Um, it's going on 34 years. Um, it will be... I believe, yeah, 34 years will be July 3rd of this year. It'll make it 34 years since uh, these murders took. The first victim was found. Okay. And can you tell us how you got so deeply involved in the case? Well, I became deeply involved because uh, one of the victims is my sister, uh, Deborah DeMello. She was the uh, third victim to be found uh, oh, November 8th. I didn't know that. Of everything I've read, I did not know that. I'm sorry to hear that. She's my she's my sister, and uh, we were close, and um, I just didn't see anything getting done, so I just decided to do things on my own. And I found out a lot that they don't want people to know. Okay. Oh my, God, my sympathies to you, Mr. Perry. No, yeah. it's, it's it's hard for me, but it was my mother that really. You know, she went to her grave not knowing what happened I to her daughter. I can't imagine. I really can't. And, <clears throat> Mr. Perry, can you name the victims in order and tell us about the they were found? Like, give us a little bio of each case. Uh, well, I don't have an exact list with me at the moment. Um, I can tell you some of the girls' names. It was uh, Sandra Patello, uh, Deborah Greenlaw, like I said, who was my sis sister. Uh, there was Dawn Mendez, uh, Nancy Piva, uh, Deborah O'Connell, uh, 
Um, like I said, I don't have a paper in front of me at the moment, so I really don't have the other girls' names at the tip of my head. It's okay, and, <clears throat> web, and, and isn't it true some of these uh, victims were found using canine units? Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, they brought, uh, brought some uh, dogs in from, uh, I believe it was Connecticut, Connecticut State Police, and uh, they uh, had them running, going along the highways, um, and uh, I believe they picked up, I think they found two, or I believe maybe three of the victims they found. Most of them were found just by luck, uh, people stopping to uh, go to the bathroom, or there was highway workers, That's, uh, highway workers found my sister. Um, it just was mostly, like I said, by luck that they were found you know they, were, they had been sitting there well some of them for months it was uh one of the hottest years on record here in uh, in massachusetts so there really wasn't uh very much left to recover um, i know that may sound a little gruesome but that's just no, the way it that's, was yeah that's just yeah that's what happened on cases like this you know yeah and there has been two publicly named suspects can you tell us a little about them that you might know yeah, um, first of all, of all, there was a, um, uh, Kenneth Pont. Um, he was a, uh, a, a lawyer of some sort who, uh, at one time or another had represented uh, some of these girls in, in cases that they had. He was also a shady character, um, known by a lot of the, the, the police officers down in, uh, New Bedford. Um, but I can want say one thing. He, he, he died, uh, since then. He, I believe he died. It was, uh, roughly two years ago. Um, he had nothing to do with the murders of any of them women. Second one was uh, Anthony DeGrazia, which they called him Tony, Tony DeGrazia. Um, he had a, um, a, a record of, uh, uh, he raped a lot of women. He, he did um, get caught for um, sexual raping them and, yeah, uh, right and beating them. Yeah. yeah. But uh, another one they were using for a scapegoat, he had also had nothing to do with any of the murders. Um, there's uh, cops down in New Bedford now that'll say to this day that it was either, you know, Tony or, or it was uh, Kenneth Pont, but like I say to everybody, dead man can't uh, stand up for themselves, you know. It's very easy to, to, to claim some, you know, to blame someone who's died because yeah. they can't defend themselves. Yeah. But I know for a fact they had nothing to do with it. There was a, uh, with Kenneth Pont, there was a, at the time, when Kenneth Pont was being um, looked into, the the district attorney was uh, Ronald Pina, and um, they actually lived next door to each other at one time. And um, <clears throat> Mr. Pina and him didn't didn't get along that good uh, very well at all. I mean, there was some issues they had had uh, in the past, and uh, it just made things so sour even worse when uh, the uh, the murder started, you know, coming in. And I believe that he. Uh, um, took out charges on him because it was a personal vendetta he had against him. And I've said this to many people, and I know that people have uh, argued to the point with me, but I really don't care. I believe he was trying to frame them, frame him for the murder of them women because of the difficulties and the arguments he had had in the past with them. I guess there was a, a lot going on with them, too, yeah. that uh, was never really brought out, you know, in the open. Also with uh, Ron Pina's uh, wife, uh, Sheila Martinez, who she's deceased at, uh, now too. She she uh, supposedly was kidnapped by these the serial killer at one time and locked in her trunk and that turned out to be a big story on the side altogether and it was also a false what she uh, claimed had been done to her. Uh. Um, but um, Tony Agrazia uh, supposedly um, died of an overdose at his girlfriend's house. Yeah, I read that. Uh, his girlfriend. Yeah, she had told him that day that she wanted to leave him, and he found out that she was pregnant with another guy's baby. And the story goes that he uh, committed suicide. Um, I have people that say they differ with that. They claim he was murdered. Um, I kind of lean that way myself. Um, I have a, a a person's name lives in Florida who is a biker that um, I have been told is the one that supposedly murdered him. Um, I never really looked into that that much, but... There's so many things that have gone on with this case that would shock you that uh, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if that's what happened. But I do not think he uh, he died of an overdose. I don't believe that. Okay. And during can I um, can I just interrupt for a yes. second, Mark? Yes. I was um, Mr. Perry. I was looking at this case a little bit. My parents are both from Massachusetts. My dad was um, 
I can say this, Mark. He was a fed up in Boston before he got transferred to Manhattan, and he worked during the Bulger days. Could it have been any of his associates that were um, involved in this? Because I know one of them, in fact, he's now deceased, came from New Bedford. Yes, you're asking if, if you think one of uh, Bulger's um, people might have been involved? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Um, I don't think so. I have... I believe that I know who the, uh, the persons or persons who did this. Um, two of them are in jail right now, and okay. one of them is still walking the streets. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, that was they, my, uh, yeah, that was my next question. In your investigation, did you develop you know any suspects? I, I couldn't hear you there. What was that again? I said that that was my next question. During your your investigation, did you develop any suspects? In, you said there's one. Well, um, me and a, um, a friend of mine, which I cannot mention his name right now, right. Um, have come up with a few different uh, scenarios, and uh, we believe, uh, like I said, that uh, um, definitely uh, one of them, possibly three of them, are involved. Um, we know for uh, for a fact one of them is definitely um, the one of the people that was uh, involved in the killings. Um, I cannot mention his name because it could, uh, you know, jeopardize his case right, right. now. And right. That's the furthest thing I want to happen right now. I want to see the right. people who did this pay for what they did, and I mean pay oh, severely yeah. for it. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. as far as your sister's case goes, was there any other victims they found dumped around the same area she was dumped at? Yeah, I think. That's the thing. I mean, there was there was women before, before the um, 1988 murders that were murdered in basically the same exact way and left in the same spots. Uh, a, a lot of it was it was like a copycat of the way they were killed. I believe that the, those uh, victims were a part of that serial killing. They only have it down for 11. Um, you know, like I said, that person, the other person I know who looked into this, uh, we can, we have a count of 22, 21 to 22, and uh, starting back in uh, the late 70s. Okay. And the police know who did this. They, they've known since uh, 2017. They've known since 2017. Um, they were uh, brought the information of the main suspect that we believe is the person. Everything just fits together, and they've done nothing about it, haven't looked into him at all. And um, it's just only a matter of time before it's going gonna, it's gonna to be brought to the public. They have very little time left to, to do what they need to do, and they know it. They've been told many, many times. When this all started back in 88, I mean, we used to try to get, uh, talk to the district attorney, I've called that office, I could tell you, probably 50 to 60 times. I have never, ever gotten a call back from him. It's always, oh, he'll give you a call. He's in court right now, or he's, he's uh, with, uh, you know, uh, things about a grand jury and just never had the time or just didn't want to talk to me. Yeah. Same with my, uh, my, my mother, uh, my sister who's deceased, her daughter. My sister had three children when, when she was killed. Mm. Her oldest daughter is here with me tonight, actually. She's in the house right now. She's 38 years old tomorrow. And uh, you know, she never really got to know her mother. Neither did the, the two younger ones. And there, there was a total of 15 children that were left with no parents after. I mean, no mothers. Their mothers were murdered. Yeah. 15 kids that grew up without their mother. And yeah, just, well, there's you know, a, there, and that's what fascinated me about the case. There was a lot of information out there. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's what. Uh, There's a lot of lies out there too. A oh, lot yeah. of lies. Yeah. I mean, right from the beginning, all you would hear, like you'd hear the news, uh, and it would come on. You know, it, was, it wouldn't come on as you know another female uh, uh, found murdered. You know, you know, on the side of the highway. You'd hear uh, another prostitute found dead, or another drug addict, or a sex worker. That's, that's how they label these people. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I, look at it, I don't care what they did on their own time. They never hurt nobody. Right. Never hurt anybody, but, but um, they just tore them apart. It destroyed their reputations right from the start. Yeah. And it sounds like a cover-up by the DA, like he knows who it is, too. It's 
It's just my oh, yeah. opinion. He knows who it is. Oh, they know who it is. Ron Pina has since died. He uh, died, I believe, it was about a year ago, maybe a little bit over a year ago. And um, yeah, I read he took about a lot that. of information. Yeah, I read about that. Yeah. Yeah, he took a lot of information to the grave with him that, uh, you know, could have been very helpful, but uh, he just, I, I don't know what his reasoning is, but he just never gave it to anybody. No one knows what he what he had for information, you know, about who who it was or why it was done. Uh, when he died, that all went away. It's gone. You know. Okay, we're going to take a short pause for the cause, and when we return, Olivia will have some questions for our special guest, Wayne Perry. Be back in a moment. Welcome back to our MJ podcast, this series. Welcome to Serial Killer Avenue. This is Episode 3, Part 4, The New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. We are on the line with our special guest, Wayne Perry. Okay, Olivia, you have some questions at this time? Yes. Mr. Perry, um, were there any samples taken from the bodies or from the clothing that could be tested for DNA? And if so, have those items been tested? Well, from what I understand, they claim there was no DNA taken. Um, I don't believe it. I believe there was samples of DNA taken because there was areas of, I believe, a couple of the victims that there was, uh, you know, like I said, areas where they could they could they could get a sample of what they needed. Um, the only problem with that is that none of the investigators that were working this case knew anything about serial killers. Not a one of them. I, uh, they didn't know anything about it. Uh, see, they, they even said so. You know, that it was a it was a first for them. So it was almost like they were being trained, uh, you know, like on the, on the job training, looking for a killer they knew nothing about. So, um, and back then too, it was it was infant it was the infant uh, infancy of of DNA testing. Back then, I mean, uh, you needed large amounts of uh, samples to get anything out of it. Right. So, um, I believe if they did have it, I don't believe it was properly packaged or stored because they knew nothing about it. You know. And uh, I've questioned that many a times, and never do you get an answer. It's always, they, it just gets written off, and, they, you know, it, the subject gets changed right away. Um, I believe if there was something that they could have used, that there's been some uh, people, you know, that have um, volunteered, you know, they would, they would look into uh, testing it because, you know, uh, they work for labs that do that, and some of, some of the people specialize in just that. But uh, nothing's ever came out of it, so I really don't know what to say about that. Like I said, it's you never get a straight police answer. Police work, in my eyes, if you ask me, you know, I mean, usually oh, it, it they're very, well versed on all all ends of very, you know law enforcement. I know now they are, um, but uh, it's just. Uh, I mean, these the different agencies because they found bodies in different towns around New Bedford. They never found right. any bodies in New Bedford exactly. They found them of the, the surrounding towns. Surrounding they did town. more fighting amongst each other than anything. They never shared information with anybody. It was it was like it was a huge ego trip they were all were on. They refused uh -huh. to share anything. And New Bedford so, is I, I what the south coast, right, of Massachusetts? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really far south. It's uh it's not that far from the uh, Rhode Island uh, um, border. Okay. It's you know, you have Bristol County, right around there. What's that? Bristol County? Is that, am yes, I wrong? Yes, yeah, it's in Bristol County. Bristol yep. County. Okay. Yep. One more question. All the victims were, were there... found. Go ahead. All the victims were found in Bristol County except for one was found in Plymouth County. And that all that did was cause another argument between the two different counties, the DAs. Yeah, it's uh, bad policing. That's what I say. Yep. All right, were there Definitely any wrong. clues left behind at the crime scenes? And if so, can you talk about those clues? Um, well, it was almost like the, well, with my sister, okay, um, she was found on, I believe it was the east side ramp of the Reed Road exit in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Um, when they found her, she was, uh, I believe it was, there was clothes, but there was none that were, she had, they had been thrown in the trees. And there was also belongings that belonged to the Piva girl who was found in the on-ramp across the highway, the westbound. And um, some of her belongings were found with my sister. So I, I believe they felt that uh, 
this guy was just uh, toying with them, or just playing games with them. And um, I never really figured that part of it out. I, they were wondering at one time if my sister had lived with the five girls. Um, they never found any um, definite uh, answers on that. Um, it was possible that she was, though, because uh, my sister made friends very easily with people. And that, right. uh, that's the reason I believe that she was one of the victims, because she trusted anyone. Right. And, you know. Right. And the thing about my sister, too, I mean, they, they found my sister on November 8th of 1988. It was the day after my birthday. Um, me and my, my niece, uh, my, my niece, my sister's uh, uh, daughter, Chandra, um, we actually watched them recover my sister's body on TV. We, we didn't know it was her at the time. But um, I remember watching it on how they said they found another another one of the highway um, murder victims. I believe she got called a prostitute that night. Um, like I said, it was November 8th, and uh, we watched it and didn't even know it was my sister. Of course, you couldn't tell. It was a, it was a body bag being taken out of the woods. Yeah. Um, I, I found out that it was her on the... Uh, December 24th of uh, 1988 it was Christmas Eve. The state police came to my house that night, and uh, I seen them coming up the driveway. And I knew what I knew what the news was going to be. Oh my um, God! When they got to my door, you know, they they had I had called them uh, prior to that because I just we hadn't heard from my sister in months and months, and that was not like her. My, my mother's birthday came and went. She never missed my mother's birthday ever no matter where she was there was always a phone call a card or a lever or whatever nothing right. that year so when that happened i didn't want to do it but i just i don't know, something in me said y you need to call so i did and they asked me a bunch of questions and uh just before we we're about to hang up the uh the state troop on the other line he says uh he says oh mr perry he says um did your sister ever have any broken bones and i thought for a second or two and I said no 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 she never had any and then I remembered at the last minute when he was about to hang up again I said oh wait a minute wait a minute she had been in a in a, a jail in Framingham Massachusetts one time and she'd gotten into a fight and she broke her wrist so I said oh yeah that's right she had she had a, her wrist had been broken one time and he goes oh her wrist and I, he goes which one do you remember and I said I'm pretty sure it was the right he goes oh the right he says to me and I, I said yeah it was the right the right side and his voice changed when he said that. Right. So I didn't really pick up on it then. I mean, I know what now why it, you know his, his voice changed because he felt you know, this is who you know I'm questioning about because everything I had said you know it just added up to her. But I guess the the broken wrist kind of like you know convinced him that yeah that it definitely was. So like I said, uh, December 24th of that year, he came to my my house on Christmas Eve and, and told me it was a positive identification that it was her. And um, we had to beg them not to, you know, get the, 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 the television stations and the radio stations involved in it because the next day was Christmas. I didn't want to destroy it for my mother. Um, so we played, played it off the next day, you know, to Christmas. And the day after Christmas, we, uh, we said we were going to my brother's house down in uh, Buzzers Bay, Massachusetts, on the Bourne, mm -hmm. on the Cape, on Cape Cod. We said we were just going down there, you know, because the whole family wanted to get together, have a dinner. And we told her then, my wife happened to be the one that took, at the time she, uh, there was um, two children that, uh, two of her children were with us. One of them was uh, staying with uh, some people up in Haverhill, Mass. But my wife took them to the beach and, and told them what had happened about their mother. And uh, I had to be the one to tell my mother that her daughter was murdered. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. And, Mr. Perry, do you believe mistakes were made by the prosecutor and law enforcement concerning these serial killings? Oh, yeah, I certainly do. I mean, the, the mistakes were numerous, numerous. So much time wasted on tennis ponds, month after month wasted, while this guy was out there doing what he wanted to do and basically just walked away. Like I said, in 2017, they were given everything they needed to put uh, to get a warrant on this on this one of these these guys and uh, bring them in. They had enough evidence. They don't want to solve this case. I'll guarantee you, for as long as I'm alive, it will it will stay alive. This case will never be solved. It's not going to happen. 
they have too much power. They don't want it solved. It's just too much of an embarrassment for what they did. It's just not going to happen. Okay, and do you think... I can guarantee you that you will never see it being solved. Well, and, and your, your thinking, do you think in your investigations you can correct those type of mistakes they made to present a case? Oh, yeah. Like I said, we got enough effort, evidence to put this guy in jail. They don't want to hear it. It was given to them in 2017. They have everything. And like I said, they've done nothing, nothing at all. You know, I mean, this was, they use this a lot for a political thing, too. Whenever it was time to, for re-election for, for the district attorney, all you'd hear, you know, the New Bedford Highway killings would come up. Oh, we're going to reopen the case, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. Well, after the elections were over, that was the last you heard right. of any case opening up for anybody. Never happened. Right. I mean, this, this is, all, all these murders have done is benefit everybody. Everybody else, it seems like that they're, High, some of the high-ranking officials down there. Uh, there's people making money on my sister and the other victims, uh, writing books, uh, doing this and that. Oh, you yeah. Know, yeah. I don't mind somebody writing a book. It helps out. It tells the story. But, you know, I'm not looking for any money out, out of it, and nobody I know is. But why couldn't there be some kind of a scholarship program or something that opened up for the children of these of the victims, you know? Nothing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All it is is just fill out pockets, fill out pockets, and the hell with the rest of them. And that's what it continues to be. That's why I put my foot in the door, and I say anything I want, and I put everything I know out there. And I don't care if they like it. There's nothing they can do about it. I say what it is. I say how it is, and I, I don't hold anything back. And they don't like that. Yeah. So I've um, actually been on my Facebook account on a, on a few occasions and uh -huh. taken things out of my account, things that I said, and you know, different stuff I put down. Just disappears like it was never there. So, in your opinion, with all the knowledge you have, why do you think they're hesitant to solve the case? Well, for one thing, uh, it, it was a major embarrassment to that uh, to, to that uh, county down there. I mean, what was what was done, and the police work alone. I mean, it just it's an embarrassment to them. It, it's an embarrassment to the to the, the DA's office down in Bristol County, to all the district attorneys that have sat in that seat since Ron Pina. And uh, there's uh, there's some other things that I, I cannot mention right now. Uh, that is a part of it too. I mean, there was a there's a a, a place in Mass called uh, Bridgewater, Massachusetts. It's the, it's the institution for uh, the sexually dangerous. There was a furlough program going on there at the time. Yeah, there I know what you're talking murderers. about. Yeah. Uh, child rape, rape, rapists, they were being let out every six days a week with no, you know, no one watching, no nothing. They had to return on Sunday nights, check in. That's it. What the heck uh, is going on in that state? Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah I read an article about A lot of yeah. corruption going on in this You know, it's state. scary because I went to college up there. You know, I... I you know, I mean, this is back in the 80s, but this is when this was occurring. You know, it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's full of corruption. I mean, it's unbelievable. At the time when these murders were going down, the New Bedford Police Department was being looked in. There was, there was uh, officers down there that were uh, either doing drugs or selling them. Well, there was a, yeah. it was a yeah. fiasco in that, in that uh, city back then. And then they had this to deal with. You know, everybody always asked, why didn't the district attorney ask for the help of the of the FBI? That's all he had to do. The FBI supposedly uh, had a profiler come in and do a profile on what he thought you know the killer was. What good is that? You know, yeah. Yeah. If, if Ron Pina had asked the FBI for agents that would actually be on the street and do an actual investigation work, it, it would I, right then and there. Like I said again, I believe it would have been solved. But okay, no, no so, one was ever asked. <clears throat> so in your opinion, do you think there is enough circumstantial evidence to at least hold a grand jury? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I sure do. They had grand jury. Um, they had a couple of uh, special grand juries back then, um, and they tore that apart because what they said is most of the people they had in uh, sitting on the grand jury. I'm talking about people they had coming in for questioning. 
and they use that word, word again, you know, drug addicts, prostitutes. So they destroyed any, um, you know, any truth to what they had to say. So if you have a reputation of being a liar or a drug addict, how are you going to be able to sit in a courtroom and have a jury believe you? With, when they made that all public to everybody, how these people were, what they were like, what their, you know, their personal lives were. Well, they yeah, tore everybody uh, apart. Yeah, yeah. They tore my sister's reputation, all the victims. They tore. They were, they were nothing and nobody. They were people that uh, they basically made it like that they were expendable. Nobody was going to care about them being missing or, or being killed. Well, I cared. Well, but yeah. A lot of other people did. Yeah, just like we're asked all the time. We have three clients that were dancers in gentlemen's clubs, and we're we're asked by some people, well, how could you work on a case like that? Well. Like I tell yeah. them, no matter what this person done or whatever, they still have the right to live. That's right. Nobody has the right to kill anybody. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. And you shouldn't judge no. people. You know, you don't know the circumstances. And I remember my mother back then. Those people have family. You know, uh, this is, this drives me nuts. You know, I mean, just the callous disregard for um, these people that were killed and. Your family and everything, it's just, it makes me think that um, this person may have known law enforcement or the DA or some of the politicians. I, that's oh, just yeah. my thoughts. I, I always go that way when I hear stuff like this because it's just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And, uh, Mr. Perry, during your investigation, were you ever threatened or were you ever threatened to back off oh no no i never was because i would have told them exactly where they could have went <laughs> exactly where they could go. <laughs> because uh i don't back off from nothing i don't care who you are or what you got i have something to say you're going to hear it i don't care if you like it or not and this is like a little whaling community isn't it new bedford yeah, or am yeah. i wrong yeah. You no, know, that that was a willing community now uh, that the book there, um I forget his name now about Moby Dick and all that, yeah. Right. Right. It's a big fishing community down there and they were trying to yeah. put it on people you know, uh, uh people coming in on uh fishing boats that were the, the people who were doing these killings or truck drivers, they put it on that. They tried everything they could to put it on uh, just to get it off of what they they didn't no, want I, any pressure on. I think somebody higher up knows who did this and they just don't wanna Say who it was. Like I said, there's things I can't mention right now. Just use your imagination. Yeah, I am. I am. Believe me. <laughs> and yeah. so, Mr. Perry, do you believe the new Bedford Highway serial killer will ever be caught? I don't see it happening. Nope. Yeah, you know, I hate to say that because, like I said, I want so much for my sister, you know, to get what she deserves, even though she's dead now. But, uh, I want the son of a bitch put where he belongs. Okay, what do you That's think what it want. what would you think it would take to make that happen? What do you think needs to happen? Well, see the thing is, is like I said, you know, police departments they have more power and influence than, you know, I do. I think it would it would take a lot of people just demanding it and it's just that it's not out there. They're not out there. You know, they tore these girls apart from the beginning, so people still have that in their minds. You got to remember too. This was 34 years ago. There's a lot of people that don't even know what the, the New Bedford Highway murders were. You know, they were just kids then. They don't know. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people who were involved or possibly knew things back then, they're either gone. A lot of them have moved away, and a lot of them have died. Right. It's not going to happen. The more time that goes by, the smaller and smaller the chance never gets. So yeah. So if law enforcement would pick it up and and that being the case they might be scattered across the United States so to them that's going to take more leg work to chase these people down oh, yeah. and uh, yeah and say once again we're talking about multiple victims so yep. no matter how old the case is there still has to be something done they've done stuff okay the Golden State Killer okay look what he done in how many years Okay, Sam Little, yep. and you know it goes on and on. So why not son of Sam? This, yeah, too? son of Sam. Yeah. Right. So why not put the same resources 
that they done on those cases on this because we're talking about multiple victims. Yes. Yeah. I don't believe that those um, those killings were. I know they were done by you know by a serial killer, but these circumstances I think were different. Um, we're talking about a, a police department that royally fouled up and screwed up this whole thing, uh, yeah. fighting with other you know uh, police agencies. All it's going to do is make them all look bad. They don't want that. Yeah. Right. They yeah. don't want right. you know. I mean the, the furlough program. They don't want that. Oh well, see, I know, things. I know about the furlough program, and matter of fact, I was, uh, I posted something years ago on one of the Yahoo uh, cold case rooms about yep. that furlough program had to go. We was talking about high uh, risk sex, sex offenders. Oh, yeah. murderers, yeah. children murderers, or rapists. Yeah, they were letting them out six days a week, no supervision. And you know, you know, here's the thing. Two of them were living right downtown New Bedford and Well Square was supposedly all this began. They were living right there, right amongst uh, the victims. Uh, and their names never came up as suspects? Nope. nope. Uh, oh, man. Very conveniently. And, you know, here's another thing, too, is uh, the uh, furlough program got sh shut down, I believe, in the fall of, of 1988. There was never another murder after that. Hmm. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I'm starting to see that there's a consistency in New England in that the police departments, especially in these little towns, have no idea what they're doing. I mean, Mark, we go back to New Hampshire with the people disappearing. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. Vermont, yeah. you know, and, you know, it's quite scary because it's places that, once again, I went to school at. I fre frequented because I skied up in Vermont. I used to vacation in New Hampshire, and you know what? I'm afraid to go anywhere now. You know, it's just, it's not right. It's not right. And these police departments should be held responsible for all of this. And yeah, they apparently should. they don't have the correct training, and it's just not right because these victims have families that are hurting, and it's just, it's wrong. It's really wrong, you know. I mean, I mean like you said, too, Mr. That, Perry, Son of Sam is nothing like this because that was taking that was in Manhattan. I mean, that's a big yep. city compared to a little town like New Bedford, you know, or yep. those towns in New Hampshire. But um, still, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, my sister was found in Dartmouth, a small little town. I okay. mean, real small. It's, it's, right. I mean, we drove by. My sister, when when she was, she was, they believe she was killed sometime in July of '88. We drove right by her, didn't even know it. we were going to Florida that year. We drove to Florida, went right down the highway, right by the exit where she was. She was laying oh. there then, too. Oh, jeez. Just, it's just so many things that, you know, like I said, the day after my birthday, I watched it on TV, my sister's body being taken out of the woods. Her daughter watched it Christmas Eve, you know. We don't have any. I mean, I don't have any holidays anymore. It's, it's the worst time of the year for me. No, no, no. I don't think you could. I really don't think you could. Yeah, I was speaking yeah. of that, of driving by her uh, remains, there there was a case where these two kids was uh, taken, the father had a visit and never brought him back, and he uh, buried him beside the 8090 corridor and uh, outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and we had a canine then that we traveled with, and we was always stopping for letting this dog out to... Uh, you know, pests and stuff. And for three yeah. years, for three years in a row, we passed those kids' body going and coming back from Indiana. And we yeah. always, we always looked at that damn dog and said, "Look, why couldn't you have wanted to take a piss where these <laughs> boys were located?" You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. things yeah. like that happens. Things like that. You know, it happens well, like that's, that. That's and how it's beyond your control. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how a few of these victims yeah. were found. You know, yeah. was, um, you know, people had to stop on the side of the road to go to the bathroom. Yeah. And they went into the woods and they found uh, skeletal remains. Oh my God. You know, so. Unfortunately, we're living in a society now where um, people look into your life and what you do for your life, and it's really nobody's business because nobody knows your background, and right. it's just sad. It's yeah. just sad. You know, well, they made sure that everybody knew world. the backgrounds of these women. And you know what? 
that's not their business. It's not their business. It's nobody's business. It's a that's human right. being that has a family. And that's right. it's just, yeah. it disgusts me. It really does. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Perry. You, said, you know, if they were police officers, daughters, or judges, or lawyers, whatever, we yeah. wouldn't be talking today because this case would have been solved. Yeah. No, no. Oh, if it was the chief, chief of police daughter, forget it. It would have been solved yeah. months ago. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you just hit a jackpot word right there. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so, Mr. Perry, is there anything else you would like to add? Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I mean, that's all I really have to say now is that uh, I'll never let let it, let it up. I mean, I'll never let any, I'll never let down on this um, for as long as I'm alive. I'm going to keep them girls' names uh, known. So I'm not going to let anybody forget them. And I'm going to hound the hell out of the police department, the district attorneys, like I've been doing for the last 34 years, and I'll continue to do. You know, they're going to remember me. And they're going to well, wish I they want you to know me. my prayers are with you and your family, and I hope you find justice. That's all we're looking for. We're just looking for the guy who did this. I know who yeah. the guy is. Yeah. That's okay. They know, too. Yeah. Okay. I'm just uh, wondering, you know, someday they're going to have the, you know, they're going to have to answer for all this. And a lot of people don't believe in karma. Well, there is karma. Oh yeah. There is. Oh yeah, there is. Oh yeah. It's a there son is. of a bitch, and it's going to come to them. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to yeah. wish that they uh, avoided all this. Yeah. Too late now, though. Yeah. Too late for them. Okay, I have a quote for you all. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Wayne. Dyer. I want to thank our co-host, Olivia, for being on the show tonight. A very special thanks goes to our guest, Wayne Perry, for being here tonight. I want to thank our viewers and listeners for tuning in, for y'all have been so kind. Always remember, folks, that if you ever get bored with nothing to do, we'll take a walk deep into the woods. You might be surprised at what you might find. That's the end of our MJ podcast, this series. Welcome to Serial Killer Avenue. This has been Episode 3, Part 4, The New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. And we say to all of you, good night from Plattsburgh, New York.
Thank you.